Welcome back, guys, to another episode of Business from the Bass Boat Podcast on the Serious Angler Network. And guys, today's show I am so pumped for. This is someone who I've been wanting to get on for a really long time, kind of a, really around the premise of how Business from the Bass Boat started, if you're someone from the beginning, um, was understanding folks who found a really more than anything, founded a business or are working in an industry where they're really, really passionate about something. And more than anything, I've really loved following guys' careers who have figured out a way to run a business and still fish at a high level. And this person really exemplifies that to the fullest extent. Um, so without further ado, let's get John Cruz on with Missile Bates. How are you, John? Good. What's up, man? How are you, bud? Dude, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm out here in Colorado and it is uh, finally actually f starting to feel like spring. It's like 70. I think it got to 79 today. So, oh, dear. Uh, yeah, That's it warm. actually it actually got warm. But what about you? You're in Virginia, right? How's how's the weather out there? Yeah, it's been good. It's been good. It's kind of a wacky spring. It's been a little bit colder than the normal overall. We've had a lot of wind over the last month. But other than that, it's it's starting to break. Last week, we had a bunch of warm days, and then it got cold uh, Monday, and we had 40 degrees and raining. Uh, had a little snow Tuesday morning, kind of wild, but then, um, you know, now it's, you know, it's back to uh, seven, low 70s today. I was out jogging with a uh, t-shirt and, you know, uh, shorts on, so it was, uh, we're back to normal weather again. Got you, man. No, that's uh, the wind. I don't know. That's been like across the country. I, I don't know why, but here too, it has been so windy and I've got just a local team tournament this weekend and we were looking at the, I was going to go and practice Friday, but it's going to gust to 50 Friday. And I'm like, man, I don't really want to be, I, I guess I can fish one side of the lake, but just <laughs> it's crazy, man. There's been so much wind all across the country. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of how the pollen gets around there you in go the springtime that's it's <laughs> part of uh, nature but uh you know from a weather perspective it is it is part of the natural course of action but uh sometimes fishing it it can be uh independent on the body of water it can be really good or it can be a, a pain in the butt sure exactly no and uh a couple of weeks ago i was on texoma uh in the toyota series and i mean we had the first two days canceled the, the wind yeah pain and in the butt there i just i'll just go ahead and say that <laughs> that place that it gets big man like i it's I, big yeah I've, i haven't ever been there before and uh you know i'd fish rayburn and toledo and some of those places that are big kind of from that standpoint but like wow texoma can get really big it's a big lake there's not much around it to block the wind either yeah yeah exactly well awesome john well i appreciate you taking the time out man um know you're a busy guy and right now we're kind of in a little bit of a break um on the elite series it's kind of like a a big break in my eyes, I guess, for the springtime. I mean, the next event, what we've got until another month, almost until Lake Fork. Correct. Yeah. It's, it's about uh five weeks or something like that in between uh, Lake Chickamauga and Lake Fork, uh, the two, two events, but we, you, we've kind of had a rough stretch for like February and March, sure. uh, especially if you made the Bassmaster classic, you know, you had uh, had two events in, in February and then first week of March, you know, we had the classic and then a week off and then Santee and then a, I think two weeks and then the, like Chickamauga. So it was the last last couple months have been been pretty nonstop and it's been tough. But luckily, I had a lot of things lined up uh, before I even left for Florida. As far as business goes, uh, we had a long break, longer than we've had in a couple years before we started this season we ended the season uh last year in in august and then we had september october november december january five full months wow yeah. um but before we fished another tournament so that was a little bit odd uh especially for the last couple of years uh but th that was that was good it was good for me we had some uh some turnover at, at missile i uh, had to had to you know train some new people and you know spending time in the office was was really a good thing and a blessing for me and just worked out great for for the business perspective and then now this little month break has been is is really good I, I, there's a lot of stuff we're trying to accomplish here in the next month or so uh, before we head to lake fork again and uh, and i'm also going to be going next weekend down to um to uh the dominican republic and derek hudnall nice. one of my roommates and good friend he's getting married so we're going down there to support him and his uh his new newly wed 
and uh, be a little vacay for the uh, me and the wife too. Very cool. That's awesome. So is it is it just you and Derek that travel together, or do you guys have a, a little group? It's a group. Uh, it's myself, uh, Derek Hudnall, Ed Lochran, and Brian Schmidt. And uh, we, the, since the beginning of last season, that's been that's been the the lineup. Uh, Brian started rooming with us some the year before that, um, but ever since Ed and and Derek were on the elites, they were they were basically part of the part of the group. Uh, they're good guys, and and all all four of us are missile. Yeah. Missile guys. So that's, that's just kind of unique. And, um, you know, they're just good dudes and, and good friends. That's awesome, dude. I, I think, uh, I think it's a, I don't know with, and it depends right on kind of how we look at things, but something that's always fascinated me in, uh, professional fishing are folks that have been able to build a business and have the ability to still take off and go fishing and I'm, I'm curious on your end with you saying, and it's true, the elite series had such a gap this year, which is crazy. Uh, as far as a five month in between, uh, during that time frame, And like you said, having to do deal with a couple of things at missile, but did that, do you feel that that time off, uh, assisted in any way on your win on the St. John's or was it not really related? I personally, I think it's, I think there's a direct correlation, mm -hmm. um, uh, for, for a couple of different reasons. Some of them uh, are not maybe what you would think. Uh, and then some of them um, are, are just a coincidence. But the uh, the only two Bassmaster Elite Series tournaments that I have won uh, came uh, uh, as the first event after a five plus month break. Uh, so wow. when, we, when I won in California 12 years ago, we had a five plus month break. I had not fished very well the year before I put the rods down. I did not want to see them for a while. And, um, and man, I, I really did not fish much at all in that break. Uh, mm. and I was questioning, it, it was kind of a, a unique experience because I, all of the equipment that I used the year before, all I did was I just put it away and then put new line on it and then went fishing, uh, th the next year, five months later. And that, that, um, I, I guess it was a good thing. I didn't have to worry about, you know, getting the reels all dialed in and that stuff. Cause I just used the stuff I was using before. Sure. Um, but that was kind of a, kind of a weird deal and, a, and somewhat of a coincidence. I feel like at both of those events, you know, I was, I was thirsty, I was hungry and I was very focused mm -hmm. on wanting to catch fish and, and, you know, you know, trying to figure out exactly what was going on. Um, so, uh, the, the, the one big difference was, when I went in California, I had a terrible practice okay. uh, for all three days. And it really, really came together during the tournament uh, at the St. John's uh, this year. I had a one pretty good day to where I was kind of calling my shots. And then the rest of the tournament, I just used my experience. So mm -hmm. it was a mix of experience on the body water and uh, a, a one decent practice day to kind of really get me dialed into to what was going on to help me win there. So it was a little, little different um, circumstances as far as the tournaments go, but uh, the big break before was not a coincidence. Yeah. Wow. Very cool. I, I think uh, um, watching that event, I mean, I was zoned in like all four days on that event and it was so cool to watch your, how you changed every day and managed to, to catch fish and and hold out and win that event. I was so impressed because you caught them differently each time. And, uh, man, so impressive to me. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. It, you know, when, when I figured out that deal on the second day of practice, uh, catching them deep up on Rodman, mm -hmm. um, I had a media guy, which, uh, Shea Baker was with me. And at the end of the day, you know, Shea was, be, you know, he was trying to accomplish his goals of what he was going out there for. And, you know, he shot everything. We shot a couple different videos and a bunch of photo, you know, did photo galleries and all that stuff. And at the end of the day, we're kind of going back to the boat ramp and he looks at me, he's like, Johnny boy. Um, I think you want him pretty good, buddy. <laughs> and I said, I was like, man, we, we had a good day. I was kind of calling my shots, but I said that deal that we're doing out there just now. He said, yeah, I said, I said, I'll get the first day, maybe the second day, and then it's going to go away because it's going to get warm. I said, if it was going to stay cold this week, I told him, I said, man, I, I feel real good about it, but 
it, you know, and so it, what I said was exactly right. And luckily I was able to figure out you know, enough on the river to complement what I at Rodman and, and it just all worked out amazing. Yeah. I mean, well, and I think just from a, a lower level angler side of things, I feel like in a situation like that, I probably would have been like, man, I, I found them. Right. And I'm going to, I would have probably spent way too much time the next couple of days trying to make that bite happen. And if I recall, you at least tried it in, in the mornings to see, yep. but I mean, where did that, is that just experience of coming back and saying, look, it's getting warm. They're moving up. I'm going to, I know that this is going to happen. I mean, what, what, yeah, that's, that's exactly what you, what you just said. That's it just from experience. And yeah. I knew that they were, they were going to be leaving it. Uh, they leaving that deep, deep stuff. Um, and the one, the one cool thing, I mean, I could tell with my rod and reel and, and the, the lack of bites that I was getting that it was going away. But the other cool part was actually visually seeing it with the, the forward facing sonar mm -hmm. and being able to see the fish and I could still see fish down there but they weren't the ones I was looking for. There were, you know, there was a few small bass and, okay. and that was it, you know, and they were, I was not seeing those big cotton balls down there. Like I was seeing, um, you know, in practice. And then the first day or so of the tournament, I was seeing a few of them the second day and the third day, I never had a bite out deep where I had been catching them. So I, you know, changed gears, caught a limit shallow, got lucky, caught that six pounder to give me the um, 13 pounds on that third day. That was really kind of the, the key to, to getting, um, getting bridging the gap, so to speak, and, and making it all work for four days. That's awesome. I, I remember during that event too, uh, Jake Latondris, who's been on the show, uh, mm -hmm. he lives legitimately five minutes away from me and <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't know it until, uh, I actually had him on the show and it was, Oh my crazy. gosh, that's yeah. wild. So we went and grabbed a beer at his bar after, and yeah. it was, uh, it was really cool, but I, he's like, you know, I'm texting him during the event and he's like, dude, like, this is really cool what John's doing. Like, so it's, it was, it was a cool experience to see it all. Yeah. yeah a Jake's, a, Jake's a great guy. I was, I was blessed to have him in the boat. I feel like, yeah, I feel like he was a part of the win with me, you know, even though he did, you know, I mean, he just captured it all on camera, but I feel like he was part of that win. And, you know, I'll never forget his participation and his emotion along with me um, at, at the end. I'll, I'll never forget the last day we were checking in yeah. and, you know, I'm just in the moment thinking about, you know, what I did and the decisions and yeah, you know, I made one decision in the last hour or so of the tournament, which I thought was an awesome decision, but given the tide and the scenario and, and I, and I didn't, I never got a bite and I was, man, I was just beside myself. I was like, man, the, all these decisions I've been making all week, this decision should have yielded me a big one. And if I caught a big one, I said, I feel like I would have, you know, I would have walked away with it. I would have won it and I would, I would have, but I would just want it by more. Sure. And, uh, so we go, we go to, we go to check in and, uh, I, I had like 10 minutes left and I was going to stop at one more place. And I said, man, let, let's go ahead and go. But I didn't tell Jake we were going to stop one more place. So Jake, Jake, uh, gave me like a five, like a half, you know, like what's up, but like that. Yeah. And he grabbed my hand like really tight. And he didn't say anything. And he just looked at me. And I was like, and in my mind, I'm like, oh, crap. Like, this just, this just got real. Like, something must be happening to where it's looking really good for me. Uh -huh. or I'm, and then so and then so I was like, I'm still going to stop at this other spot on the way in. And I stopped. And I made about three casts. And I'm like, I need to make sure I get in. I don't want to break down and then be screwed. Like, okay, I gotta go. So then I ran in, <laughs> just ended up running in, and uh, he he knew he knew what was up. Sure, it was funny. That is awesome, man. Those those such he cool just, moments. Yeah, he spooked me a little bit there at the end. Yeah, yeah, dude. That's a. Uh, I mean, out of all the stuff, man, he's a busy guy, and and the elite series stuff. Like he, that is his man. That is as good as it gets. And that's so cool to, to see, to, yeah. to experience that emotion, I think is the part that he's so drawn to at the end of those. Absolutely. On yeah. the days. Absolutely. Oh. And then, you know, and you know, he was with Christy when he won the classic and, you know, he's, he's been with Jason a number of times and, you know, they have a relationship and, you know, I think he was emotionally invested in, in that win. And I talked to Jake after, after at the next tournament, I talked to Jake for a little bit about Jason's win and, 
the way he said, man, the way you called your shots and like you just made great decisions. He said I, the same thing was happening for Jason Deere in that tournament. He was calling the shots, making it. He said he was, you know, on the, on the last day he was saying, man, I need I need like one more one or two more good ones. And he was riding pockets looking for the certain type of bank and dock. And he said he went to three different different pockets to before he finally said, there it is, Jake. Wow. And he rode back there, dropped the troll motor, skipped under there, caught a two, like a two and three quarter, and then caught another one of like a three, three and a quarter, called out two fish, gave him like another pound and a half. And that's what won the tournament for him. And then he went in like in the, that was in the last 20 minutes. Um, so, you know, Jake was just like, man, you guys were looking at it and you were seeing it and you were feeling it. He just, it was cool. It was cool to, to hear Jake uh, on the, like kind of the inside stuff on, on that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. No, it's a, it's a really cool perspective. No doubt that he gets to experience. Um, are you excited? Uh, I mean, we're talking about Lake Fork coming up in May. Uh, yeah. what let's, let's hear your thoughts on that. What do you think, um, kind of the fish are going to be doing we're talking mid-may late-ish may what, yeah. what's going to be happening at fork it's the third week it's the third week of may i have fished i have fished fork uh multiple times in april and maybe three three or four times in in may mm -hmm. and that's a that's a that whole any time in april or may are good for for lake fork uh so so in april there's usually a lot of fish still spawning Early May, there'll still be a few fish spawning, but then the shad spark, spawn starts going on pretty good. So then you get some topwater frog action, depending on the water level and things like that. Um, but then there'll be a few fish that start to show up offshore. And they'll, basically, like each week throughout May, you're going to have a few more and a few more and a few more. And then the big ones really get out there in June, which we've, we've never fished a tournament in early June on Fork. I wish we would, because I think we would just catch you know more tens than we've ever caught mm -hmm. uh but we, we we don't we're we're about two weeks before i feel like the peak for the for the big ones out there on, on fork as far as the deep fishing but those they'll still be maybe a few fish spawning there'll definitely be plenty of fish shallow if guys want to fish shallow uh, i know the lake's down right now but there'll still be a few fish shallow uh there'll be a lot of like shad spawn type stuff going on uh, still that'll be kind of on the tail end. Uh, and then there'll be more and more fish starting to move out offshore. So, uh, it'll be, it'll be a good event. It'll be, I mean, they have had a really good spring mm -hmm. from, from the things I've seen down there. They've, you know, all the tournaments, you know, like the big fish tournaments, guys are talking about catching tons of fish and, and big ones. And they have those kayak tournaments where they catch weigh and release them. And, uh, it's been taking, you know, big weights down there for that kind of stuff. Uh, and the fishing's just been really good in general. So, uh, so I think it'll be a lot of fun. I'm looking, I'm looking forward to it and it's not going to be one of them deals where you, where you just need to catch limits, bro. You're going to have to you have to bring <laughs> it. it. <laughs> yeah. I think those are my, uh, I like this time of the year fishing wise, uh, probably the, the, the part, especially watching an elite series event. I like when it's a versatile situation where you could have a guy on the bank to a guy that's already catching those fish. Yeah. Off. I love that yep. versatility of it. You can kind of figure out what you want to do and uh, see if that's the winning pattern or not. Yeah. I had, a, I, I've had um, like one Ed Locker was asking me, he said, dude, why, why is it fishing so good this year? Like what it, the lakes low, is it because the lakes low? I said, no, 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 it's not fishing good because the lakes low it's fishing good because the last two, I think the last three years, mm -hmm. it has been really full throughout the spring. Yeah. So that means they've had really good spawns and a lot of those fish, ah. the, the bluegill, the bass, the crappy, everything have survived. So the fish populations probably jumped up mm. more than it has like three or four years ago. The fish population was down pretty low sure. on fork. I mean, by fork standards, it was pretty low because that lake just gets the absolute piss beat out of it. Yeah. And, and it, but it keeps producing and it will produce even better if it'll be at full pond you know, throughout the spring and the spawning season. And, and it was the last couple of years, last, I think of the last three, if I'm not mistaken, it's been full, full. And that that's huge for that. So I, hope, I know it's down this year because they're working on the dam. Hopefully next year they can bring it back up and they'll have a rainy, rainy spring and, and be able to keep it full and have another good spawn. Yeah. I think that that's is a, uh, and this is just from uh, 
good group of my friends live down in West Texas and like OHIV and Choke Canyon, mm-hmm. some of those reservoirs down there. And it's a total boom bust cycle, right? Like when you have a couple of years where the water stays high and yep. bait fish population, everything has a good spawn and there's just yep. life happening. That's, it sounds like that's kind of similar to what you're, what you're thinking is happening at four. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's to a degree what's, what's definitely happened. And it's, it's, it's on a little upswing right now. And, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting down. I do. I mean, the, um, MLF guys, they fished the, I don't know, I guess the BPT or something down there mm-hmm. in March and it was freezing cold. I mean, yeah. like they frosted their nuts off and they still whacked them pretty good. Them. I mean, even for as cold as it was, and those, I'm telling you, them F1s or Florida Street, they don't like the cold too much, it's- but man, they still caught them pretty good. Yeah, that was impressive. It was cool. And like you said, it's so low. It just looks so crazy. I mean, it's just everything is all the timbers exposed. I fished uh, it one I fished it one time when it was low like it is now. Mm-hmm. Uh and, and it actually makes it easier to navigate because you can see everything that yeah. you're gonna you're gonna be everybody's saying, Oh, there's stuff in the channel. I I mean, I'll probably knock off my lower unit this year since I just said that, but right? <laughs> I never hit anything that year. And but you could see where the danger was and you knew where to you know, back off and, and kind of idle through. So, uh, I, I mean, Toledo Bend's kind of the same way. It's easier to navigate in my opinion when it's like, you know, five, six feet low. So, uh, so it'll be, it'll be good. It'll be fun. It'll be, it'll be interesting to watch too. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Well, before we get into missile baits, that'll be kind of the next section of the show. One last question I had for you was just in relation, you're someone who has gone out, you lift a lot, you're a health guy when it comes to, uh, outside of the fishing world. And that's a, that's a passion of mine. I enjoy working out, running, lifting and that side of things. Yeah. When you are on the road as much as you are. So like this last year, I went independent contractor for my job and was able to fish a lot more tournaments. Mm-hmm. And I feel like the whole gym side of things, I got, would get out of routines and that kind of a thing. I mean, what are you, what are you doing to stay in shape on the road? Are you lifting at events or are you it's all when you're at home yeah i don't so i don't um during tournament weeks i don't i don't lift um and a a good friend of mine um ken hoover he 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 passed away last year actually but he really educated me because he followed the sport and and was very interactive with us with a lot of the anglers for for a while So he got to, you know, he explained a lot of things to me in a different perspective. He's a a sports nutrition performance guy for 40 years. And that was his forte. And, you know, he and I spoke a lot of the same language, but he just gave me a different perspective because there is not a lot of information on professional anglers and fitness. Like there's just, there's just not. Uh, So he, he kind of related to me, the activities that we're doing, how to fuel myself better, and um, he explained to me that basically what we're doing in a, in a practice day and in a, in a tournament day is the equivalent of running like a half marathon. Wow. He said, so you're, you're burning the same number of calories that you would in, you know, approximately a half marathon. Um, so that that's a lot of calories, man. That's a lot of. Uh, so what that, you know, what it means is you you've got to recover every day. So if you're talking about that'd be like running a half marathon and then going to the gym and lifting, like that doesn't make any sense your body, like your body can't recover from both. You need to, you need to have your body at full recovery as best as you can each day so that you can do that same activity over and over again. Cause I mean, you've already seen it. A lot of times you'll have back to back tournaments. So you're talking, uh, you know, 12 or 14 days in a row of running, what's equivalent to a half marathon or even, even a, you know, a five or 10 K. Yeah. Um, I mean, you're running, you're running these races on a daily basis is what your body feels like it's going through. So you've got to, you got to fuel, fuel your body more than normal uh, and then hydrate. There's a big thing. And then make sure you get uh, enough sleep for your body to recover. Like that's, those are the biggest keys. And the, the, when I go to a tournament, I don't want my body to be completely depleted and, and in a recovery mode. I, like when practice starts, I want my body to be fully recovered. Yeah. Like just totally ready to rock, um, to, to be able to withstand 
what I'm getting ready to put it through in the next week or two weeks or, or however long I'm going to be, be going at it. And that's, that's kind of the way I look at it. Um, you know, I'm not training for a physique competition. Sure. I'm not training for uh, a powerlifting competition. Mm -hmm. I'm training just for overall general health and um, to try to be able to make my body uh, in as good a shape as I can so that I can have quick and good recoveries each day in between fishing. Dude, I like it. And I think, uh, I think that's a good mindset to have. Um, in, in 2019, I ran a half in a full marathon and the fuel aspect, like you're saying, uh, that it was the biggest factor. I ran a really good half marathon and you, you're having to, even on a half after you've been running for 50, 60 minutes, you have to be fueling your body with food, not just water. Yep. And so, and so yep. that is a thing I think that a lot of anglers miss out on is on those long days. Like, I mean, how many guys do you talk to who are like, oh yeah, I didn't eat anything today. I was doing this. And it's like, man, but then, then your mind's not working right. And you're not hundred percent making that cast exactly where you needed to. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Your cognitive skills definitely go down when you're, when you're under uh, malnourished, under uh, your caloric uh, intake that you need. And when you're, you're dehydrated, you, you're your casting skills, your cognitive skills will not be as good, period. No, there's no questions. There's zillions of scientific, scientific studies that can prove it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I like that approach because, you know, fishing hasn't always been the most athletic thing viewed and, and like there's, there's guys who definitely aren't super athletic in fishing, but I think that there's some advantage there, uh, to be fully, fully ready to well, go. I mean, the, the body weight thing is really, uh, like some of the bigger dudes surprise me at how well that they, they have endurance wise, like some of their body, you know, bodies are just surprisingly endurance. But if you look, look now in the last 10 years, okay. the majority of all the successful anglers, the majority of all the, um, angler of the year winners, I mean, their, their body shapes, sizes are, are similar. I'm just going to throw, throw it out there. And I mean, like guys, like, let's say Ott Defoe, Ott's not a big workout guy, mm -hmm. but he's, he's in pretty good shape. Sure. Um, I mean, you look at guys like, uh, you know, David Mullins, good shape, good dudes in good shape. He's, he's highly competitive. He's, he'll be in the angler of the year race pretty much every, every time. Um, a couple of years ago, um, you know, Justin Lucas won, he's in great shape. Um, Brandon Pollen is competitive in AOI race every year, wins events every year, just about. And I mean, he and I have like the exact same frame. Um, mm -hmm. Ike and Ellie, we, we got the same frame. He's like an inch taller than me or two inches or whatever. <laughs> but uh, I mean, so there is, a, I think that's kind of like the prototypical body of, of the, of like an endurance athlete. And that's, sure. that's kind of the way you look at it uh, to me. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, I agree with that. I think there's some correlation there. And I, you know, people I, I, will they'll pull somebody out and be like, "Oh yeah, so and so, he's he's kind of a big dude." All right, we got one out of twenty. Yeah. The rest of everybody um, is, you know, similar shape, size, fashion to be able to to take that kind of beating for for an entire season and and be able to perform at a high level. That's just what it is. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. And, and like you said, those, those back-to-back -back events, and then you make a, a long drive between and like you, you, you're, you're running on, on low stuff there. I mean, some of that, that stuff's just, I mean, you're, you're running out of uh, things. And so you need to be fueling your body for sure. Yep. That's it. Awesome. Well, let's get into missile baits, man. This is really a uh, exciting part of the show. I just wanted to get into how that all started for you and, um, Let's let's start at the beginning. I mean, sure. When when did it start for you, and and how did you kind of get things rolling? Uh, I started it 10, 10 years ago this year, and okay. um, really, I started competitively fishing full time in late two thousand. So okay. yeah, twenty two years ago, I started fishing Bassmaster, and it was basically doing it full time right off the bat, uh, and people, you know, my dad would ask me, you know, how are you going to make a living at this? And I explained how the sponsors and all that kind of stuff worked. And he said, okay, well, you know, you wish me the best and let me know if you need anything kind of a deal. And, yeah. and I, and I told him, I said, the fishing will lead me into something else business wise. Uh, I was, you know, business econ major in school. If I wasn't 
if I wasn't out here running around chasing fish professionally, I would, I would be owning my own business. That's just my mentality. That's what I've learned and all that kind of stuff. So that's what, that's what I was kind of looking for right out of the gate. And, and initially I thought it would be maybe a TV show. You know, I was, I was seeing you growing up watching Hank Parker and Jimmy Houston and Bill Dance. And those guys all leveraged their tournament success and the notoriety that they had gotten on the tournament side to have a successful TV show. And I thought that seems logical. I tried. And then after about a year or so, I said, no, that's not, that's not going to be me. That's not what, that's not the direction I want to go. And it, you know, didn't take too much longer. And I started working with Spro, you know, designing crankbaits and promoting them, doing the promotional side to help them sell and help educate people on how to use them and what they're used, you know, why they were designed the way they were. I loved that process. So it didn't take too long before I didn't have a soft plastic sponsor. And I said, Hey, I want to do this with soft plastics. So for two full years, I fished with whatever I wanted to. I mean, I was buying everything. I, sure. I bought whatever I wanted to, to fish with. I had no obligations, no, um, no alliance, no nothing on the soft two, plastic for, side. on soft plastics for two yeah. years. I had nothing. So after, after using everybody's stuff that was on the market, I said, man, I need something that does this. And I need something that does that. And I need something that does, I had all these ideas in my head because I couldn't find exactly what I wanted. And then it, it kind of dawned on me, man, I want to, I want to start a soft plastics company and design all these products. And then I can promote them just like I do with Spro. I thought it would be perfect. Yeah. Believe it or not, I, I had two different companies that I talked with about designing baits for them kind of the same way I do for Spro. Okay. And then I, I decided I don't think I want to go that direction. I want to start something that is completely new branding. Yeah, I, I wanted to control the brand from day one, make it totally new and really start fresh with the consumer. That's so that's what we did. And gotcha. uh, I initially I had, I, I thought I was going to need a partner or two. And I, I thought a couple other, I had two other pros in mind. One of them ended up getting a significant deal and said, man, I, I can't turn this money down. This is stupid. I said, I don't blame you, dude. I would think you were stupid if you didn't. <laughs> and then the other one was just, you know, him hawing around about it the whole time. And I finally, towards the end, I said, man, I'm going to just do it myself. And I want to bring you in later as, you know, just being a part of it. So that that's kind of how that went down. Gotcha. And so I, you know, ended up starting it. And it, of course, whatever you business plan you make, it's all you can just go ahead and double that. And that's usually what it's going to cost to kind of get the business <laughs> off the ground. Sure. Um, yeah, you know, the majority of all small businesses that fail, fail because they're underfunded. And uh, luckily, I was able to uh, to continue with uh, with missile and we were able to keep going until it, w it became self-sufficient and um it's it's been a big it's been a l big learning curve for me as far as you know if you think you really know a lot about something start a business doing that and then you realize how how little you do know about it okay that, that's kind of how it was for me with missile but uh the, the blessing of being a pro angler was that you could pick the phone up and people would answer your calls and it was, or they would call you back. And, and that I utilized that a lot. The first few years, uh, I mean, I still do, but I utilized that the, the first few years of, um, being in business and asking people a lot of questions and, you know, the fishing industry is an awesome group of people in, in, you know, in total, yeah. because they the majority of people just want to help each other and you know we're yeah we compete sometimes but man we're just you know we all have the same passion and we're all kind of into the same thing and you'd be surprised how even how much even competitors will help you you know you call man i man my bag supplier he's all squirrely oh man you need to use who we use they're great you know here here's the guy's number call them up you know tell them i sent wow. you and yeah you know that you guys and, and i mean I, I, I've done that a ton since since I've kind of gotten into 
you know, gotten more established with missile baits, but uh, it's, it's a, it's a fun environment. And that's kind of the, the process of how, how I got into it and how I got going. I mean, even today, I, uh, we had a, uh, I mean, a technical issue with Bass Pro mm -hmm. shops and, and the way that they order and so we, they had to change over our buyers. They had the, they've had the same lure buyer for like a million years. He yeah. retired. The new guy came in who we've dealt with him some before, and he he didn't understand the deal that we had we had going from uh, from like late last year. He called, you know, he sent an email, and I said, "Oh man, I'm, I got to call him." So I called him. He called me right back, and then we had a a great fifteen minute conversation, and we got got back on the same page, and he understood what we were what we were doing and why we were doing it. So um, it's just, you know, I feel like some of those conversations are just are made a lot easier and they're w more willing to listen because I'm a pro angler. And I just feel like some, sometimes I do get a little bit preferential treatment bec because of that. So that's, that's one of the uh, benefits of it, of that leverage, like I was talking about earlier. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's a huge leverage. And I think it's, uh, I mean, if you can also from the standpoint of, uh, building a brand around yourself and <clears throat> competing and all this stuff. I mean, you're using all these products that you're also producing. And to me, that is, mm -hmm. uh, that's as good as it gets. I mean, you're, you're, you're sponsoring yourself from that standpoint of things. It, yeah, definitely. And you know, with, um, <laughs> with the, with the fishing industry industry being relatively small, it can work both ways. So if you screw somebody over, your reputation will precede you in that direction as well. And, uh, you know, in, in the 10 years, I've tried to treat everybody as fairly as possible. We pay all our bills on time, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, and that reputation gets out there as well. <clears throat> that somebody, it's somebody you want to do business with. Oh, yeah, they're willing to help you, that kind of stuff. There, there's plenty of, of good people like that in the, in the fishing industry. And uh, I really enjoy being a part of it as a business owner as much as I do being, you know, a, a pro angler. I like both sides of it as well. Yeah. I like that, man. And, uh, in the, in the beginning in those first, uh, I guess, couple of years, let's say, I mean, do you remember any major, um, hangups or, or struggles where you were like, my gosh, how are we going to get through this? Or was it all pretty smooth sailing for you? Um, it was relative, relatively smooth sailing. I mean, there was in the first, I think three, three years or so, I had to, um, I had to put in more capital into the company, uh, mm. before it was self-sufficient it, you know, it, it takes money to grow a company. And that's, that's the one factor. I feel like a lot of small businesses, no matter what industry you're in, that you don't factor in. Um, if you want to expand your product line, if you want to, you know, try, you know, try to obtain new territories, you want to increase your distribution, a lot of a lot of times that just takes additional capital and you know you're you're making enough money to pay all your bills and and you know function as you are but you can't grow that way you're going to have to continue to invest more back into your company and sometimes in order to grow it just it just requires more capital so we had to do that i had to do that a few times in the first few years but luckily uh, as as i tell people I've been able, I was able to catch them good enough in those years that, that I was able to, uh, you know, yeah. continue to invest in missile yeah. and, and make it, and make it keep going. So, uh, so that's, that's kind of how that, that stuff goes. Yeah. Well, no, I appreciate you bringing that up. I think it's a, um, I was listening to this podcast. I think it was a podcast or I saw it, I might've read it in a book, but, uh, the other day that was talking about, you know, like, okay, you can look at a business from like a lean startup standpoint. Or you look at these guys right now, especially very popular, all this venture capitalism uh, using other people's money. And mm -hmm. I've always kind of been on the mindset, okay, well, like, I don't, it's hard to like go ask for money, but the conversation really came out to uh, in, in this podcast, it was like, here's the deal. When you have a situation where you are able to just have capital and, and, implement it. You are going to go hire the best people. You are going to go uh, figure out the best situations. You you have the ability to do things that would take much longer by yourself and you may be giving up some of the equity in your company to do so. But it was an interesting conversation because it made me really think back to that money can be used so much more efficiently in that startup phase at times. 
Um, that's a that's a slippery slope, in my opinion. Um, yeah. I think early on in your in your company, whatever what you know, fishing industry or non fishing industry, early on in your company, you want to you do not want to give away percentages of your company for an investor if you don't have to. Yeah, sure. Uh, and and the reason for that is you know if your company is worth you know let's say you value your valuation is a hundred thousand dollars and you give away ten percent of it, um, that's a big chunk or you know or you have to give away because your company is only worth a hundred and you want somebody to give you thirty grand you're gonna have to give away thirty percent of your company potentially sure. to get to get that investment to whereas if you can if you can chug along and and survive to where your valuation could can get to a million dollars and you need to give away 30 percent. you're going to get 300 grand for that so you know the the company valuation is part of that formula that you can't ignore Uh, that's one of the things i've learned over the years but fortunately i haven't had to give away i have to get away zero percent of uh missile baits um now if I took part of it, took an investor on and we had an influx of a huge amount of cash, we probably would, would just would have grown faster. Sure. Uh, but I was willing to play the, to do the long play in order to, you know, re- continue to retain a hundred percent of, uh, of the ownership. Yeah. And the control of that. I know. I, I right. agree. I mean, and I think that through this podcast, they were talking with like, I mean, a tech startup where it was, needing to have a ridiculous amount of capital to yeah, build. Can, I mean, if, unless somebody's just, I mean, there's very few people that are ludicrously rich up front before they start a company. Most people that start companies are, you know, have some money, but are looking to try to make a lot of money. And in, in those cases, if you're talking about tech companies, um, I mean, you can't get a damn, uh, a good engineer or web designer, not not necessarily a web designer, but like a uh, programmer. Excuse me. You can't get a good programmer for less than like three or four hundred grand. Yeah, <laughs> dude. That's I mean, big capital. <laughs> that's a freaking lot of money. That I mean, that's a yeah. ton of money for a year's salary. That's but that's the going rate today. That, so today, depending on what company you type of company, if, if I mean, if you got a couple million to just throw into a company, then that's a different story. But sure. if you don't, if you got a couple hundred thousand you can't go hire a programmer. I mean, <laughs> this is the way it is. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's, it is cool too, to talk to other business owners and just kind of hear about their, their struggles and their, their things. And I, I'll tell you that, you know, you asked about any hurdles <laughs> about, I don't know, four or five years, five, five years ago now. Okay. Uh, we had a, uh, a large distributor that, that we should have cut off. Okay they were a large distributor. They, they got to be probably 15% of our business somewhere in that range. Uh, they were doing business with Walmart and some other big accounts and they kept stringing us along. And I knew I was in the, you know, they were late paying, late paying, habitually late paying. I could tell they were in financial problems. My instinct was that they're going to, they're going to crap on us. And eventually they just totally lied to us. Oh, and told us that they secured all this money, everything was good, and we needed this big shipment, and that we can make everything happen. Everybody's given us their these big shipments, so we can make all these big Walmart orders. And I believed them, and it was a total lie, and we never got paid, and we lost over a hundred grand. Oh, geez, um, that we never saw. I mean, they they had to file bankruptcy, and they never paid us. Uh, the Zoom got Zoom got screwed over for a million, or right at it, uh, over a million, I think it was. Um, you know, Yamamoto got screwed for right at a million, like 900 and some thousand. So there was, you know, I was not the only one, Mm -hmm. but there were were other companies like, uh, river to sea, river to sea. As soon as they, they were slow play paying and didn't, they cut them off. They said, we're not selling to you anymore. Yeah, You can buy through, you can buy through, you know, another distributor. And they're like, well, we're a distributor. We're not going to buy from another distributor. Like, well, you've basically crossed the line for us. Sure. And we're not going to sell to you anymore. So they got screwed out of zero dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was like, mm-hmm. you know, so if, if somebody, you know, is, it goes back to that old, old, old adage. I think it was a Maya Angelou quote is, you know, if somebody tells you who they are, believe them the first time, you know, so that's, 
that's kind of, you know, a business thing that I, I mean, I don't, I don't let anybody that's take right. advantage of me anymore in business period. Like if somebody's jacking me around, I don't need them. Screw them. Find someone We're out. done. We're yeah. done. I'm not going to be screwed again. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's a good lesson. And to me, I mean, and just through some of the interviews with this podcast, um, dealing with different folks and, and off air and on air conversations, it seems like the late pay situation seems to happen just in the fishing industry to some extent. I mean, what, do you have any thoughts on why that is or, or that's every industry. It's yeah. not just, it's not just pertaining to the fishing industry. It's every industry. <clears throat> Some are better than others. Sometimes companies allow themselves to get taken advantage of because they just want the business. Yeah. So the more, the more hungry a company is for business, the more they're going to allow themselves to get taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. And, and we're, we're just not going to allow that. Um, we, we have a, like, we have a policy at missile, like you're, you know, on new dealer orders, they have to pay with a credit card on the first order, <clears throat> you know, before we give them terms. Yeah. I don't care who the references are. Um, we're going to, they're going to have to pay for the first one. And if they balk at that, that's a, that's a, that's a huge red flag and we will watch them and they may become, you know, COD, you know, have to, or, you know, so I, I don't, you know, sometimes you gotta, you gotta be, cautious of how anxious you, you know, like, man, we just, they put in this, you know, $40,000 order. This is amazing. This is great. Well, it's only great if they pay, you know, yeah. who, you don't know who these people are and I don't care what sign is on the building or what reputation you think that they have. I'm telling you, everybody can try to jab it in you. So just be careful. Gotcha. Gotcha. Good advice, especially for folks interested in starting their own thing. I think that's yeah, and, and never, never let any one customer become more than like 20% of your business if you can. Oh, I think that's, that's a huge deal. A lot of people get, they put a lot of, they, you know, they, they're like, oh man, this is a monster account. This is really what we need. Next thing you know, 40, 50% of their business is in with one, with one customer. They, they got you by the sack, son. I mean, they have got you over a barrel in whatever policies they want to do. You have to do it or your business is going to, it's going to go away uh, or you're going to have to make major changes because you're going to set up your business based on whatever revenue that you're doing the previous year. And if 40, 50% of your business or more is with one client, that client's got you over barrel, bro. I mean, they have got you. Exactly. So try to keep at least, you know, no more than 20% of your business with, with any one particular uh, client or customer. And, uh, and try to have as much, you try to, like we started out, uh, you know, with Missile not wanting to be, um, to compete with any of our retailers online. We, we, we uh, you know, artificially inflated our price on the Missile Bates website uh, in order to just give our retailers comfort that we're never, never going to try to undercut them. Sure. And we did that for a number of years. And then now we've come back to where we, we, our prices are basically standard with what everybody else's are, you know, suggested retail is. So we've kind of gotten past that phase. Um, but doing that and not really pushing our own website and trying to drive traffic to everybody else's site for missile. Um, we didn't make missile baits a high enough priority mm. looking back early on, uh, as far as direct retail. So, I think that the optimal mix is to have maybe 20%, 15 to 20% of your business being direct online. In house. Okay. Yeah. That gives you a lot of um, control to not have to uh, do whatever, you know, do what everybody wants you to do. Um, you know, not, you not be under control by three or four customers that, you know, can screw you over. Um, like you kind of set your own tone. So if, if one, one, um, place gets turned off, those customers probably are be programmed and they're going to know, Oh yeah, you can still get it at their, their own website. Uh -huh. You know, like I, I listened to a thing, um, about a year or so ago and I'm like, dude, that makes so much sense. And that's kind of where the direction we wanted to go. And then, and then it validified it, validified it is that the president of Nike said that their optimal direct to consumer business is 20%. Okay. That was their optimal percentage and that, and they are dead on 20% of, 
of, and that's exactly where they want to be. So it's almost like a, 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 you know, they, they push it just enough to get it there. They don't want it. They don't want it more, but they don't, and they don't want it less. They want it, to, you know, a fifth of their business. They want it to be direct to consumer. Obviously the margins and stuff are good, but there's a lot of, a lot more costs that you have to do to be able to warehouse and ship fast and uh, staff to do it. And, uh, you know, systems to make it all happen and that kind of stuff. It'd be a lot easier if you just shipped it to like three giant distributors. But then again, you've kind of broken that 20% rule as far as giving too much of your business to one particular client. So um, right. there's a there's a proper ratio, I feel like, for for businesses in most most industries and, and especially in the, in the fishing industry that you just don't want to put too many eggs in one basket. And uh, you want to make sure that you be able to control your own destiny to a certain extent. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're diversifying uh, with the ability to sell from the house. So uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. And uh, if one of those funnels shuts off, you always have that. And um, I didn't yep. even think about what you said as far as the ability for those uh, consumers, if they were con always getting um, at box store B, but then they went away, they're going to go straight to the site. And then now you're, you're back in it. So yep. that's right. Awesome. Awesome. Um, I guess another question I had just in those kind of, as you grew, do you have any thoughts or, or I guess it could be advice to anybody trying to scale a business to the point where you are having, you know, a lot of employees, multiple employees dealing with duties. I mean, you get to a point to where obviously you can't do all this by yourself and fish the elite series. I mean, how did that scalability kind of work for you to grow? Uh, well, you know, when we started missile, I started with two full-time employees plus myself. Okay. So I didn't want to, I wanted to start with a, an existing body, you know, of, of employees. I didn't want it to be like a one man show or like one man and my wife. I didn't want to, I didn't want to half-ass it right out of the gate. I wanted to, I wanted to make it a, a, a real entity immediately. Yeah. And, and, that, and that, so that's why we, we kind of did that. But that, like I said, that took a little more capital up front. Sure. Um, but we weren't, we weren't hiring programmers. We were hiring an office manager and a, uh, a very, like a utility knife of a, uh, of an IT guy. Okay. Um, so that was kind of the, uh, I mean, it was the optimal mix of the first two employees that you could, you could ask for. I mean, he designed the website and he shot videos and he, did graphic stuff. I mean, he did all kinds of different stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very, very useful and, and perfect for, for us. Andy, Andy liked to fish. So it was, it was kind of good for, for missile in the beginning to, to have somebody like that. And plus we, and then we got uh, the office manager that we hired. We got amazingly lucky. She was with us for 10 years. She retired uh, last year, but she was amazing because she was very, very loyal and, she never let anything fall through the cracks. She had amazing attention to detail. The customers loved talking to her on the phone. She is not, was not by any stretch of the imagination, a salesperson. She did not want to be, but she was amazing with customer service. Gotcha. And that's what, what, that's exactly what we needed. We needed a voice and a person that, that when they called and said, Hey, I didn't get six bags of these, you know, green pumpkin D bombs. She's like, okay, great. I'll get them out to you today. Yeah. And if she said she was going to do it, by golly, she did. It's awesome. No matter what, she would do it. If she had to go to the uh, post office and and take them down there herself, she would do it so that they went out the day she said she was going to do it. But that was just the kind of person that she was. And so we got extremely lucky that Julie was our office manager for 10 years and kind of was able to, um, you know, be like a rock uh, when I was when I was gone. And so I didn't have to worry about the company. I knew things were going to get done. I knew the orders were going to get processed and I knew uh, everything was going to, you know, everything else was going to, was going to happen like it was supposed to because she treated it like it was hers. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's a good way. I, I think uh, seeing uh, stuff in advance of, of, like you said, starting with a base of employees, I think is uh, is a great way to, like you said, more capital, but it allows you to, already start to grow so much faster i feel like and having having especially someone like you said the utility knife side of things being mm -hmm. able to do a lot of different tasks uh, under the same kind of employment right that's awesome um at this point i mean fishing the elite series full-time are you pretty much 
your role, obviously managing the company. Uh, what's, uh, what's kind of, are you completely free and clear when you're at an elite series event and then you come back and you're right back in it? Um, pretty much. I mean, when I, when I'm at a tournament, everything is, is very self-sufficient, but the, I mean, the things that I do that can't get done, I mean, designing new product, sure. um, deciding on pricing, uh, if we have issues like we had, <clears throat> like we had today with Bass Pro, I'm not really, it was just something that had to be cleared up that new person didn't understand. Mm -hmm. Like that's only something that I could explain to them really. Uh, because yeah. I knew how it used to be. And then, uh, I mean, our new office manager, Melanie, she's doing an amazing job and she is, uh, I mean, a blessing as well. She's a great, great employee, but she doesn't know all the history. And so she's still learning, even if she's been, she's been with us uh, since October, she's still learning all of these terms and, and it, but she doesn't know all of the history. Sure. So I, you know, th that was something only I could explain to, to them. Um, but you know, when I'm gone, everything runs fine. All the orders come in, every, all the orders go out. Um, and I've gotten a new, uh, Alex, uh, Watts, he, he, um, he was a intern with us a couple years ago. Uh, he went to work and we didn't have a spot for him when, when he graduated from college and he went to work for Z man for a couple of years. Z man was, for, uh, was nice enough to let him come and work for us when <laughs> I needed an inventory specialist. Uh, he wanted to move back to Virginia, and so it just re it really worked out well for him. But he's taken some of the stuff off of my plate as far as keeping up with all the inventory and doing all the ordering. Uh, you know, because with you know with jigs, you've got weed guards and hooks and skirts, and I mean, then you got you know many you know micros and minis and full sizes, and uh, you know those have a lot longer lead times, and you got the packaging and all the cards and boxes, and I mean, dude, there's so much to it. You know, I, I did it basically for ten years. And so we hired him uh, last last fall, and so he came on, and I've been training him ever since. He's doing he's doing a good job. He's taking some things off of my plate as far as the inventory stuff, which is great. Uh, so now I can do more of the content creation that I'll enjoy doing and we need, and we're we're kind of uniquely positioned to do. Uh, so I do more of that, and then and then obviously the the new bait stuff and the new projects, and then just managing everything kind of together. Like we're um, in the back this week, reconfiguring the warehouse and, and how we have things stored. The majority of our stuff is great, but about a quarter of it, we're reconfiguring and we're adding, oh God, probably adding another 20% of ability to continue to increase the product line. So uh, that, I mean, it was a necessity. We needed to do it. Uh, we have a new bait coming out next month called the magic worm robo worms making it for us it's really awesome really and then cool. we went back there and looked and we didn't have any place to put it <laughs> so uh we, we you know, i had to go back there we you know we're, mark's our warehouse manager he's he's great and, and you know, we just had to we had to kind of like you know put our heads together and alex was helping us and we just really put our heads together reconfigured where a lot of the uh overstock inventory was going and um, all that kind of stuff. It was, it was, it's been fun. It's, it's challenging, but in now it's exciting. I, I had to buy some more shelving, but we're probably going to be able to have, I'd say close to another 20% capacity, uh, because of the way we reconfigured wow. things. And then the, the additional shelving and, and that's exciting. Like we're all excited. We're like, yes, we can, we can bring in a bunch of new stuff. We get the magic worm. Yeah. We get this other bait coming later in the fall. We, we got another proposal. I'm trying to work out something with this other company. So we, you have a lot of, lot of stuff going on and I'm trying to, trying to continue to grow it. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, that was kind of how I was looking to wrap up the show was just, um, what do you guys have in store in the future? Anything you want to tease right now? You said the magic worm, but what's coming for missile baits in kind of the second half here of 2022? Yeah, that, that's an OEM deal that, that Robo worms making for, for us. Um, they're using obviously their technology, but, but it's a worm that I designed. It was something pr very particular that I wanted okay. to put in my box. And it, I mean, it's nothing crazy special. It's, I mean, it's a, it's a straight worm, but the proportions were exactly what I wanted to be able to use it like a utility knife, uh, to use that, uh, analogy again, but yeah. you know, you can drop shot it, you can shake your head, it, you can uh, finesse Nico rig or Neko rig, however you want to say it correctly. Um, you can, 
you can wacky rig it. You can fish it a bunch of different ways. And then we did it in our colors. So Robo Worm did it for us using their technology, but yeah. all of the colors are unique to missile. So we're, you know, like John's cool. juice and Ed's orange and um, watermelon violet, things that we, that I wanted that Robo Worm does not currently make. We did a tw we get 12 really, really cool looking colors coming. Uh, that's that's exciting. That's coming towards the end of May. We're going to get that in stock and start selling those. Uh, I mean, the dealers are really jumping on it. Distributors are jumping on it. I think it's going to be uh, very successful and a big a big deal. Robo Worm, you know, they they came to us and said, "Man, we're good at making stuff, but we're not good at promoting it. You guys are good at promoting it." You know, <laughs> and they kind of explained what what was going on. And we're we're the first company in the U.S. that they've uh, they've worked with and are, are making other products. So, you know, we got this product coming out and we're already starting to, to work on something else. That's awesome, man. That's, uh, that's exciting. I can't wait to check that out. I love, uh, I like baits where you can do a lot of things with them. Um, from right. Yeah. Baits, I mean, I, you know, I went, I went fishing a tournament last weekend, uh, with our warehouse manager, Mark. Yeah. And I caught about half of my fish on that worm. Nice. Caught the biggest one that we weighed. We had 16 and a half pounds or something. And, I just put three different colors in in a bag of that worm, and that was all all the straight worms I needed. Uh, I put, you know, then I had a couple D bombs and a few other things. This was, but that's all I needed because I was I caught one on a Neko rig, I caught one on a wacky, and I had another one on a drop shot that I did I just didn't fish, and I could have thrown it on a shaky head, but it's just wasn't really. It was more of a spawn bite, so I didn't, I just didn't use the shaky head. But I mean it. Is, it really is uh, is a handy <laughs> handy bait to ha have, and I've already caught a ton of fish on it. Awesome, awesome. We'll look forward to seeing that. Um, and kind of how I like to wrap up every show, John. You've you've had some awesome advice, but for someone interested in building a business uh, or working in the fishing industry, something around their passion, what's one last piece of advice that you give somebody? Uh, in in the in the fishing industry, especially. A lot of uh, a lot of it is is relationship building, and that that goes to across other industries as well. <clears throat> but if you if you can build relationships with people, and you have to do them one at a time, um, you know, there's it's interesting to me. To, you know, in the world we live in today, in the social media information age, uh, people like to try to build their social media audience. And they think that is relationship building with with an actual human being. And it's it's two different things. It's not. There is a huge value in building a social media audience. Absolutely. But people don't know who you really are unless they know you as a person and know you personally. A lot of people that are big social media stars, so to speak, in different genres and different categories are not good people. I would never in a million years do business with some people that I know of that have big audiences because they're just not good people. So build those relationships, treat people fairly, treat people nice, treat people honestly, tell them the truth, do what you say, say what you do, all that kind of stuff. And those relationships will grow quickly. All of a sudden, you know, one, you know, one or two people, well, those people know people and uh, you, you need to make the effort to continue to do that relationship building with all those, all those other people. And uh, that pays huge dividends in the fishing industry uh, and in, and in you know, other industries as well by doing it the same way. And it's not about kissing, but it's about meeting people, finding out who they are and, and finding out, you know, how to work with people and what they expect and what they want. You know, like, dude, I can do that. I, I can, you know, you know, you just helping, helping other people out can, can go a long ways in, in building those relationships. Awesome. Awesome, man. I think that's incredible advice. Relationship building is, is massive. And, um, lastly, I keep saying we're gonna end the show, but this is the actual end of the show here. Uh, your three biggest large mouth spotted bass, small mouth, um, and what you caught them on and where you were when you caught them. Um, my biggest large mouth, um, was on a, um, uh, like a really light Neko rig. I was trying to catch, it was like a wacky worm, basically the way I was using it. Okay. Um, but I was down in Florida at, on the St. John's got 11 to, uh, straight, straight 12 pound sunline braid and, um, Yo. 
caught an 11 2. It was pretty, pretty amazing. My, my biggest spotted bass, I'm not 100% sure, but I think it was one that I caught really early in my career on a drop shot. It was on a robo worm mm -hmm. out of a brush pile on Lake Martin in a tournament. Okay. And I don't, it, it, the big fish for the day was weight was, was like a six and a half pound largemouth. But this was a spot and it was pushing five pounds. It, I think it was like in the four and four and three quarter range, like four twelve somewhere in that range. Big spot. That's the biggest spotted bass I've, that I know of that I've caught. I've caught a ton of fours, but mm -hmm. I've never caught one that's up in that, uh, that four and a quarter to five pound range. Um, I did have one that was, that I caught off of a stump at uh, Lake Hartwell on a uh, little John crankbait. I was reeling it and it got hung in a stump and I went over and I pushed it off with my rod tip. And when I pushed it off my rod tip, it, it, it pulled drag. That, that was a giant spot I caught in oh, practice. Man. That was the same. It was about the same size. It was pushing five, four and three quarter, five pound range. I'm not sure which one was bigger. Um, and then I don't know what my biggest smallmouth is. I've caught a number of fives. I'm not, I don't know that I've caught one over six. I've caught, I've caught, five, you know, in tournaments, I've weighed one that was five thirteen. I think at green Bay, maybe it was, wow. yeah. um, but I've never, I don't know that I've caught one for sure over six. I know there's a lot of guys up there that out there that have caught a lot over six. I've just never been one of them. Smallmouth, I love catching them. Um, if they don't like me for to catch them, I think is, is part of the problem. <laughs> they run away from you. Dang it. Yes. Those big ones. Those six pluses. Gotcha. Yeah. Awesome. Well, John, I appreciate your time and I uh, want to re be respectful of your time. So I appreciate you coming on. And yeah, um, yeah man. Thanks for, uh, for thanks, all the I appreciate you having me on, man. And I, I really enjoy um, what you're doing. I think that's it's great that – to give the business side and business perspective to, um, to people. And like, I just, like I said earlier, I want to reiterate that there are a lot of good people in the fishing industry. It is a unique, um, industry from that, from that angle. I feel like that by and large, the fishing industry is binded together by a common interest of, of sport fishing. And we all want more people to fish. We all want to make a living doing what we do. And, and so there's not as much animosity that I have seen in this industry as, as what I think exists in, in many other industries. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome point, man. And, uh, makes it, makes it fun. And everyone's, uh, everyone seems to be good people, at least in my experience this far is good people. For the most part, there's a few bad apples. I don't care. If you get a hundred, get a hundred people together, you're going to have a couple of a-holes. That's just you're, the way it is. That's going to be in any, anywhere you go, man, a bar, that's right. uh, any, any industry. So I'm with you. All right, John. Well, have a good night, man, and I appreciate you coming on. All right. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it.